The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. This is Hillary Atkin of the Office of Housing. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, I'm joined today by our HUD floodplains expert, Jeremiah Sanders. He'll be giving us some great training on floodplains management, uh, wetlands, and flood insurance today. Uh, please feel free to ask questions. If you have questions during uh, the presentation, you can do that by raising your hand through our little NIFTY webinar tool or just submitting the question via text through the same tool. So without further ado, Jeremiah, take it away. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Jeremiah Sanders. I'm with the Office of Environment and Energy. Uh, my main focus is on floodplains and wetlands. Um, today we're going to be dis discussing two executive orders, uh, 11988 and 11990, as well as uh, um, flood insurance requirements involving HUD funds. Um, Okay, um, Executive Order 11988 was issued by President Carter in 1977. Uh, its main purposes are, or its main thrust were to require federal agencies to avoid development of the floodplain and to develop regulations. Um, the purposes behind these requirements were to avoid development in the base floodplain um, or your 500 year floodplain for critical actions, and we'll go into that term later on. Also, to avoid adverse effects or impacts of the floodplain. Um, and another requirement within the executive order is to also consider alternatives to floodplain development. Uh, this is a quote I like to focus on. It, also, it pretty much gives the main thrust to both the executive orders, which is avoidance. Um, floods are acts of God, but flood losses are largely acts of man. Um, with today's technology and history related to floods, making a decision to redevelop or develop new properties in a floodplain are largely engaging in a hazard that is known. So by avoiding these areas and avoiding this type of development, you are preventing the disaster from occurring. Um, HUD implements the executive orders through 24 CFR Part 55. Uh, it applies to basically any hard cost in the floodplain with limited exceptions. Um, the requirements whenever the um, executive order is triggered are to either make a determination that you are triggering the eighth step or adopt the exceptions. And if you have to do the analysis, you're going to either do an eight step or five step analysis. Okay, and this is a little focus on the exceptions. Uh, the first one's the easiest if you're not in a floodplain on a FEMA map. And that includes um, any advisory-based flood elevations or preliminary maps that may be issued by FEMA. Um, you do not have to proceed with any uh, further documentation. There's also uh, an exception for incidental portion for a flood floodplain, which is where a floodplain is on the property, but it is not involved in any of the construction activities. There's no paved areas. Basically, it's open green space, and it will maintain its natural functions and will not be used um, as part of the development. Um, there also are the available, availability of letter of map amendments and letter of map changes. Um, this actually involves going uh, to FEMA and getting the map changed, either because you are adding fill, which is more soil to the site, to literally elevate the land surrounding the site and including the building out of the floodplain or getting a letter of map amendment which says that you are challenging the methodology used by FEMA and you would like to correct their error. Both require um, a pretty significant amount of uh, professional correspondence with engineers or surveyors. Um, and then there's also a five-step process that is an abbreviated process for more minor rehab activities. And we'll, we can get into those more in depth later. So Jeremiah, you'll You'll talk a little bit later about uh, when something is minor versus uh, substantial improvement because we've got a lot of public housing projects that where someone's doing just a light touch and they're in a floodplain, if someone's doing some thing about the major rehab. Will we get to, will we talk about that later or no? Yeah, it goes further in depth. I talked to Hillary, she kind of. Yeah, this is just a brief overview okay, in the beginning great. so we know what gotcha. we're getting into. Okay, we're gonna perfect. Do. She's customized my presentation for the RAD program, so i got to remember what was radicalized and what wasn't. 
Um, <laughs> okay, um, these are uh, three actions that you should always. Um, sorry, I got to get back in line. <laughs> Frame of thought. Okay, these are prohibited actions. These are the big no goes. There's no waiver. There's no real savings. Um, projects that have these type of issues, um, other than getting the map, uh, the map changed or any back in the flood insurance program. The first is a floodway. Um, these are not just your normal floodplains. Think of it as like a, either a dry creek bed or actually the creek itself. These are areas that actually have flow and um, they are just really bad places to build. But you'd be surprised how cheap the land is and how some people will try to throw our money into these areas. Um, second area is the coastal high hazard area, which is also known as a V-zone. Um, think of this as the area in between a seawall and the ocean. So basically it's on the wrong side of a seawall. And when that happens, you're not only getting the storm surge, but when the storm surge is deflected off, you're getting hit both times by both the storm surge and its retreat back in the ocean. So these are also bad sites that we try to avoid. And uh, generally they're more expensive for flood insurance purposes as well. Um, and then if you have an activity that's occurring in the special flood hazard area on a final flood insurance rate map, um, statutorily we're not allowed to build there because we cannot obtain flood insurance for that area. And when you cannot obtain flood insurance when the community is not participating, we are statutory prohib statutorily prohibited from funding the project. Okay, um, these are your basic requirements for documentation. Um, if you don't have an exception, you're going to um, need a FEMA map saying that you are outside of the floodplain. Um, if you don't have an exception and the FEMA map says you're in a floodplain, then you're going to have to worry about your five-step and your eight-step analysis. So a good rule of thumb would actually be to go through the exceptions, the second bullet first, because um, if you have an exception for minor rehab and you're still in a floodplain, um, your A stuff's not going to apply, but you will still have to worry about flood insurance. But um, if you have the exception, you are okay with the Part 55 process. And then if you have a map that says you are out of the floodplain, then you're done too because you show you show the you have shown that there are no uh, floodplain impacts to the property or to the property itself. And then so if you keep proceeding down and you have um, an action in the floodplain, you're going to want to look through the 5512A exceptions, which lists the different activities that are eligible for the abbreviated five-step process. And um, if you don't fall into any of those, then you are stuck with doing the full eight-step process, which includes two rounds of public notice. OK. Um, with the RAD program, uh, the applicants will be submitting a lot of the documentation for you. So you should have with each project a uh, FEMA map and, and or an exception that says whether the project will be subject to an eight step or five step. And <clears throat> if they have determined that a five step or eight step is required, you're going to want them to give you a list of different mitigation activities that may be possible as well as uh, any impacts the site may have. And we'll go into impacts and mitigation later on in the step process. Um, and as for timing, um, you're going to want to get the maps early on, and, and as well as all the floodplain information and mitigation and alternatives, because you're going to have to have all of this before you can start or actually complete your eight step process. Okay, so this is a weird slide that I kind of threw in here. Um, I've had some questions lately about just kind of in general, what do we do when we're looking for our documentation and it's obvious that things are missing. Um, the answer to that is basically get back with the applicant, let them know what you need, and um, uh, keep following up with them, get everything that you need. The other answer, if you don't feel like dealing with that hassle, you're having a lot of trouble, um, you know, what, whatever your reasons are, is to go to the HUD Exchange Environmental Review website and there's a bunch of stuff on there that can help you get the information you need. So let's say you're just simply looking for the FEMA map that applies to the site to figure out whether it's in the floodplain or not. There's a link on the website that can take you to the map center. 
Um, there's also helpful sample documents for if you're putting together a five-step or eight-step analysis uh, or a public notice. Um, so just some ideas about where to get that help. Okay. And then another weird slide that I put up. Um, so everybody always asks when it, you know, what do we do with the 4128? What do all these different things mean? Um, when we're doing these trainings, we're kind of reversing the order. We're talking about um, the 4128 in the context of all the different things, as opposed to all the different things in the context of the 4128. So if you're looking at the 4128, what we're talking about today, floodplain management, is item number 17, uh, which you can see on the screen. And what you would be doing is going through the process that Jeremiah is outlining in order to make the appropriate check for yes or no, whether it's in compliance, and then discuss any documentation and requirements for approvals in that box. If you go to the next slide, you can see that in 4128 sample field notes checklist, there are some additional questions to kind of help you um, get to where you need to be in your analysis to make a determination. So that's where this is on the 4128. And if we keep going, you'll see there are also slides on heroes. We go to the next, oh, there it is. Um, which is much more useful as far as step-by-step -step guidance uh, than the 4128 is. Um, and we'll still ask you for the same kinds of determinations and attachment of supporting documentation and that kind of stuff. So um, just wanted to give you a heads up on how the documentation works, whether through 4128 or through heroes. And these slides show you the different questions you'll get. Okay. Now back to what Jeremiah is really here for. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so now we're going to get into if you have found that you do not have an exception to the eight step process and you do have an activity that involves um, an actual project in the floodplain. And we're going to want to go through your eight-step analysis. Um, before you start that, you're going to want to consider um, alternatives before you even go to note, before you even issue a notice. It, I mean, it's, the process actually says find out if you're in or out of the floodplain, and then you issue a public notice. But for all intents and purposes, before I issue a notice, I would want to make sure that there are not alternatives that are right under my nose for a better site or a better use for that project. So you can save on publishing costs and just different bureaucratic hurdles that may not be necessary. Um, and if there are no other sites available, oh, can I go back one? Sorry. Um, you can also think about redesigning the site. If you're doing a full-scale demolition and you can move the footprint outside of the floodplain, um, it's not always possible, but if it is, that's um, a quick and easy win. And you'll also save on mandatory flood insurance costs, so it may actually make the project itself not only safer but more affordable. Um, and again, this is an example of the letter of uh, <clears throat> map revision form. Um, as I said earlier, you can go through FEMA and get either a letter of map amendment if you think the surveying is wrong or you have an engineer that says this doesn't pencil out right and maybe there's an anomaly or irregularity in the um, flood insurance study. Or you can get a loamer, which involves actually filling in the site with soil. And do you mind saying what those two acronyms are, LOMA and LOMA? Yeah, a LOMA is a letter of map amendment. And then a LOMER is a letter of map revision. And um, this is a chart that basically outlines the decisions made in the eight-step process. So if you have the yes, just start going through your two of early public review identifying impacts, and then looking at alternatives. Um, so as you can see throughout this process, the easiest thing to do is to not be in a floodplain. And again, what triggers the fact of the eight-step process? You're in a floodplain, you go through, so if it's in the, anything that's in the floodplain, you'll do the eight-step process? Anything in the floodplain that does not have an exception. So certain things like soft costs and planning costs, we don't really tie those into the site yet. But once you start, you know, getting out your hammer, start acquiring property, the disposition of property, um, anything with title changing hands and actual construction, you're generally going to get triggered into an eight-step or a five-step process. If, I, um, if I'm acquiring an existing building, not doing any new construction, 
that existing building is in a floodplain, and I'm going to transfer the assistance over there. I'm not newly constructing it. It's already in a floodplain. Do I, is it an exception, or do I have to satisfy them? So this multifamily building that you're acquiring and then you're transferring it? Um, we got to be an H step. Oh, wait. Well, I only cover the rehab. rehab. Yeah. So yeah, because there's acquisition, you would have to do a, a complete eight. And so, so, if, so unlike there's in something that's not in your, your area that someone calls site neighborhood standards having to do with minority concentration, in the site neighborhood standards protocols, if you are building new construction in a minority area, you have to get HUD approval of the site. Um, but if you're just acquiring a property, it's a different standard altogether. So what you're saying here is in a floodplain, it doesn't matter whether you're doing new construction or you're acquiring existing structure, it'll still be subject to the ACEP process, decision process. Um, I have to repeal into the five step, but uh, because you're acquiring, um, it would require the full aid, I believe. Um, there is an exception if you're doing just rehab for something you own. Sorry, that's also family. Yeah, yeah for a I'll get a five step. Putting assistance in the building is already a plus one. Not assisted today. I mean, yeah, uh, because a big thrust of the executive order is to avoid any involvement with federal funds in the floodplain. So by putting federal funds okay. into the site itself, you know. that was seen as an activity we're supposed to avoid whenever practical. Okay. Go back one, sorry. And I'm sure my REOs will, are feverishly going through uh, Part 55 right now to correct me at the end when I'm wrong. But um, <laughs> okay, back to the decision-making process. Okay, these are the three main things you're going to want to take take away for and spend the most time of the eight-step process on: uh, the consideration of alternatives, whether it's rearranging around the footprint or maybe expanding uses for uses and um, productive units on other buildings or other sites or just different, um, just different means to do the same job that do not involve occupying or modifying the floodplain. And you're going to have your two public notices. Uh, the first one's 15 days, the second one's seven days. These are calendar days, so if you're pretty uh, I'm sure you're going to be involved in the eight step process. You should go ahead and mark off 22 days that you're going to have to wait at minimum to get through the eight step. And uh, also you're going to want to consider mitigation. Um, these are the different techniques that you're going to take where you're going to try to minimize the impact of the project to the floodplain and the impacts the floodplain will have on the project as well. And we have uh, an example of that. Okay, so now we're going to break down the individual steps. As I said earlier, uh, your first step is are you in or are you out uh, of the floodplain? Um, for most actions, and I think, does Brad involve any critical actions? Or? I don't think so. Is, it, is there elderly or disabled housing? Yeah, it could be. Could be more likely probably family. Okay. Yeah. Well, most of the time you're going to use the 100 year floodplain, but um, if you were to have uh, a large wing or component of the units dedicated to nursing homes, disabled uh, living, or people that cannot evacuate, um, you're going to want to look at a larger floodplain, which is the 500 year. Um, it, it also comes up with police stations and fire stations, but I don't think that's going to be as um, helpful for this program. But basically, you're going to want to make your in and out determination and have a copy of the flood map with your site marked on it. And um, if you get a map that says you're not in, that's the end of your documentation. But if you do have a site that's in the floodplain, you'll proceed to step two. And um, oh, this is another thing to again consider. These are two of the areas I warned you about earlier that you are to avoid. Um, the first course is floodways. Again, we're talking about more of the dry and wet creek beds where any given rainstorm is going to have a impact on any structures occupying it, and your coastal high hazard areas, which are um, unprotected areas that are uh, 
vulnerable to um, coastal storm surge. And um, here we have an example of an older flood insurance rate map. Uh, if you see the white outer area, that's the area where you would want to develop because that is not in the 100 year and not in the 500 year. Um, as you go in closer to the hash line, you'll see a lighter area that says zone X. That's your shaded zone X area, and that is your 500 year flood plain. Um, so that, that is the area that you're going to be concerned with for critical actions. And uh, it's, it's a larger area than the 100 year, obviously, which is the, the darker gray area, which is your zone A or zone AE. Don't, I need to work on a better panel. I don't see zone A on this one. But um, anyway, the darker gray area is your 100 year. That's your zone A and Apple. Um, and it is the 100 year for all intents and purposes. Um, and then inside that is the hash line. Um, and it's on both maps, but that's your actual floodway. Uh, on the color map, it's a little easier. You can see the white lines where it's, um, it actually sticks out a little bit more, but that's the floodway area that you pretty much have to avoid at all costs unless you, unless you were to have a functionally dependent use, which is like a boat dock or a uh, marina, and uh, I don't see Rad having but many you, of those. you could build in the, like in the middle uh, where the floodway is, just to the right, some development there now. If I, was, if I was acquiring that site, ripping all that stuff down and building on it, because it's not in a floodway, I could potentially build there? If it's not in the floodway, you could build in the zone AE. You see where it doesn't have the white lines through it? Yeah. Uh, where it's still colored, but it doesn't have the white lines through it, that's your 100-year flood plain. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about the eight-step process. And uh, this is and then if you look on the lower left, the frequency is zone X, and that is uh, your 500-year floodplain. So, uh, yeah, the newer maps are a lot easier because they have a satellite image overlay. Uh, you look at some of the really old maps. For instance, I have one on my desk from 1983 in Louisiana. It has maybe two out of four roads on it, and um, it's really hard to tell where anything is. Okay, and I'm going to... Explain a little bit about uh, incidental to the site, which is one of the exceptions you can have. You can go to the next slide. So basically, if you have a whole parcel where um, it has floodplain within the project site, but the floodplain is not being developed or used for anything but open space, you can go through an abbreviated process where you basically create a covenant or deed restriction on that floodplain area, saying that you will not develop that area for perpetuity, and then you can forego the process and you just leave that as uh, open space. Um, there are also different entities that will, you can actually get write off for conservation easements for some of these. Um, I was just talking to the Nature Conservancy, and they are uh, one of the potential big um, holders of conservation easements like this. We have a question. So uh, Harry's asking, what actions are defined as critical actions? Um, the definition is, let's see, what is that, 55, yeah, 55.2B, uh, the B2. Anyway, uh, it's in the book, and it's basically your fire stations, uh, your hospitals, uh, your police stations. So you want your first responders and your medical to be operating in a flood event. And then it's also your nursing homes, uh, your disabled, uh, sometimes your elementary schools or some daycare slash flood areas. Uh, the second category is basically people that are going to have a tough time evacuating, and it's going to put a lot of strain on our first responders as well. And there's a third category, which, exclude, which includes um, dangerous chemicals and toxic sites, as well as sensitive materials. So think of that as and this shouldn't come up, hopefully, in the RAD program, uh, toxic waste sites, um, explosive chemical storage facilities, or a place, say, if you hadn't modernized your um, county's records and you had all of your um, land deeds in a paper format, and this actually came up in Louisiana in some parishes, um, these are also documents that you're going to want to have to make sure that you can prove who owns what 
and um, that's another important thing that probably doesn't come up as much with you guys, but just to let you know. Yes. So hopefully you guys will not have many critical actions. Yeah, it's, it's things with like a major evacuation concern, basically. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thanks. Yeah, I think we're going to move on to the next one. Okay, so if you actually have the structure or even um, just the corner of it or any part of it is in the floodplain, you are now in the floodplain. You cannot use incidental portion if you say, oh, well, only 50% is in or only 20% is in or even if 1% is in. If a survey says even that one corner is in, it is in for floodplain purposes. And Jeremiah, does that include improvements? So like Yes, that good point. It also includes parking lots, uh, any ingress and egress, or any area that's being used not for open space and uh, basically land that can be used for drainage. Um, and this is another um, thing to look out for. Um, a lot of people want to use the loamer to fill in the land. Um, this is basically only a, a letter of map revision. So this would be what they call letter map revision dash F, uh, LOMER F, and the F is for fill. So some people fill in their site, but when you do that, you're actually impacting the floodplain for the entire community. Because if you throw, think of it as um, a kid who fills the bathtub completely full to the top without being in it, and then gets in the bathtub and it flows over and they ask why. Um, well, just as a kid was occupying physical space and displacing water, so is the amount of fill that you're putting in the floodplain. Um, and there's also a lot of case law out there. You can find several examples of large-scale developments where they used a lot of fill. And then after that event, uh, um, what used to be a routine storm now causes flooding on uh, neighbor sites. And they have won um, uh, damages in several cases with that, uh, <clears throat> with that claim. Um, just the level of causation and science around hydrology has changed a lot in the last 50 years, so now it's a pretty accepted tort. Uh, well, kind of the takeaway from that is if we see a situation where there's a LOMER F for LOMER, we might want to look at it again. Just keep that in mind. Yeah, a LOMER F may get you out of the eight-step process, but it will not get you out of potential liability you may have to adjacent property owners. Um, and this is another caution about the FEMA maps themselves. Um, as they are currently being implemented, the FEMA maps do not look at future conditions or expected trends. Um, as people at FEMA say, they are basically an example of driving in the rearview mirror. They can only look at historic events, so they only look in the past. Um, so saying that that means that at the day that they the day that they are published and released, um, it, they start losing their um, documentation of reality right then. Um, if a big box store is put in the floodplain, or a new avenue, or cul-de-sacs put it into the floodplain, it starts changing the hydrology of that area. So you're going to want to be aware of that, the future development trends, and you're also going to be aware of any anomalies that are in the area. And uh, that's why I have Washaway Beach and uh, Minnewauk in North Dakota there. They had uh, one is an example of erosion that has been occurring at a very uh, fast pace. And then at the bottom, they had a lake that was just simply moving throughout the area. And um, so what I'm trying to say is if you have local people on the ground that are saying this is, there's been some weird things happening, do not just rely on the flood insurance rate map and op operate like you have blinders on in that the flood insurance rate map is the only source of information. And on the same note, it's not going to cover sea level rise as well and subsidence issues. Um, okay, step two, after you found out you're in the floodplain and you don't have an exception, um, you're going to want to work on your early public notice. That's pretty straightforward. Uh, you're going to want the name of the project, um, a description of where they can find it on a map, the activities involved, the acreage involved, and um, a location of the environmental record where someone can come in the office and actually see what you've researched so far, as well as um, a place to send comments. And uh, we have an example linked at the 
like blow. This is another, another one of my weird slides. So we had some questions uh, last week or the week before about how practically does public notice go down uh, out in the field? And so I talked to uh, one of our very reliable multifamily staff members. Uh, his name is actually Joe J. Bond. He goes by J. He's happy to talk to anyone if they have questions about these tips or want to talk about them in more depth. Um, but he just had some um, information about you know, how this usually goes. So usually what happens is the applicant posts the notices uh, and they are actually required to pay for them. And what they'll do is they'll draft up uh, a notice, HUD will review it, see if they're comfortable with it, and then the applicant will call the newspaper, get the rates, and put that ad in. Um, the usual cost is anywhere from uh, $1,000 to $1,500. And the newspaper, we're talking about, you know, like local newspapers. So we're not push putting this in the Washington Post, we're putting it somewhere local, and if it's in an area of the country where there's bilingual uh, newspapers, we want to put that in there too. And you'll notice in the um, notice language that there's discussion of contacting other agencies. And what he usually does is send them an email, let them know what's going on. So just a few tips. OK. And um, thanks, Hillary. Uh, after you issue your public notice and um, consider all the comments, you're going to want to consider uh, your alternatives. And you have to consider alternative sites in light of all of your other project goals, obviously. Um, and, oh, and always consider the possibility of a no action alternative. Um, if you look at all the other sites and the site involved and they all look like nightmares, maybe the best thing to do at times is not to do anything at the current time. I know it's hard for us to say, but sometimes it does happen in certain situations. So let me go back to that. So I've got a PHA that uh, uh, hooked up with a developer. The developer wants to build this floodplain. And uh, so we asked the question, well, have you thought of alternative sites? The developer comes back and says, yeah, but they're wicked expensive. And so uh, is that a reason to allow them to build in this floodplain? Um, that gets into practicability, um, which we discussed throughout. But it basically means are your needs as far as housing more important than the risk that you're imposing on the people that you're putting on that site? And that's a calculus you'll have to run through every site and every program. Um, I've seen some localities say that they just do not want to deal with floodplains in general, and some programs are a lot more adverse than others. But um, that's kind of a program call uh, based on your own level of comfort with floodplain development, as well as the flood insurance costs that will apply throughout the future. So I don't have a quick and easy answer on that. I'm amazed that that flexibility, varies, variety, whatever. Yeah. Um, it's the nature of it. I mean, once you get out of V zones and floodways, um, a lot of rationales can be made. Some are better than others. And Okay, so after you look at all of your different sites, you're going to want to look at the different impacts to the sites uh, as well as the, the alternatives. So this is kind of how you can both gauge the impacts to your site and also start to look at some things that are going to trigger costs in the next step. So uh, especially with the floodplain site, you're going to want to look at the water resources. Um, is there are a lot of wetlands involved and a lot of water quality issues around the site. Uh, if it's a floodplain area, it probably had a lot of storage and a lot of um, importance uh, with the groundwater recharge. You also want to look at your uh, flora and fauna, your plants and animals around the site, uh, cultural resources. It can also, which means it can also intertwine with you know your sort of preservation and archaeological requirements as well as if it was an open space area in parkland, too, you're going to want to consider the cost of um, losing that use and um, that benefit to the community. And also there are your agricultural, aquacultural, and forestry resources. And um, 
and also be aware that some of these impacts can be both positive and negative. Um, if you're talking about a demo of a site, that sometimes could be a positive for your water resources. If you're um, installing a lot of rain gardens and making an existing site better, you can also look at that as some uh, potential positive impacts. But that gets into more of the next step, which is um, if you still can see or still continue to proceed with a floodplain site, you're going to want to look at different mitigation or minimization techniques. Uh, minimization is the word that's actually in the executive order. It means to reduce to the smallest degree possible. And by possible, we realize that there are funding conditions within every program and every site itself. So it doesn't mean that you have to build the highest level that is attainable through modern engineering. It just means that if you can avoid it and you can reduce the risk to both the people and the property, you should really consider doing it and take a hard look at those different aspects. And some of those are um, watching out the limit fill so you're not pushing the floodplain into other people's property. Minimize grading. Um, you're going to want to have as little perv uh, impervious surface as possible. Um, there's different uh, pavement surfaces now that can actually uh, different pervious pavers, I should say, that either through like interlocking bricks or actually like a concrete foam-like material, water can actually make it through the pavement. So you don't have as many runoff and drainage is issues. And um, another way is to relocate non-conforming structures. If something's in the floodplain and you don't need it there, please move it if possible. Uh, um, you want to preserve your natural drainage, your natural plants as much as possible. Green roofs are another good idea, as are rain gardens, detention ponds, bioswells, um, any easements you can use, and um, of course, flood proofing or elevating or when possible as well. Okay, so if you've ran through the analysis on the floodplain site and you looked at the alternatives and you still think that the floodplain site seems like it's going to be um, the site that you're going on going to continue with, you're going to want to reevaluate. So now that you've done more research on the site and on the alternatives, you're going to want to consider um, in light of what you can do to minimize the impacts and the impacts there, should we still proceed even though we know there's flood risk here. And you're also going to look at the relative cost and uh, potential increased hazards and everything else. Uh, go ahead. And then uh, if you still want to proceed and you still think your best alternative is in the floodplain, you're going to have to republish again and justify your action to the public. And also show some of the work that you did um, through the previous steps. Basically, what, tell the story of what happened between um, your previous notice at step two. And again, we have uh, examples of both the notices and um, a model eight step pro uh, process on the website. And um, step eight is kind of. Actually, sorry. Uh, okay, go, ahead. Mind, go back to the previous one. So I do this final notice. That's it. I'm just telling the public this is what I've decided. There's no more comment period, right? It's you do long. actually take the comments. You're supposed to take comments during the period. Yeah. And so you just respond to the comments. So in this step, is you publish and you respond to the comments. Okay. Okay, and the final step is to make sure that your eight step and your documentation was not just a paperwork exercise, and hopefully it will actually reflect reality. Um, I'm sure as a lot of uh, my employee or coworkers in my office can attest to, sometimes you'll get great environmental reviews, but then you go out to the site and none of it became a reality. That is not compliance. We actually need this process to reflect what's going to happen on the ground. And that's why it's kind of a very underrated aspect, but crucial aspect of the entire process. Um, yeah, another important thing is that this must be completed prior to uh, your FONSI being finalized. You can actually, if you have to publish a FONSI, publish the final at the same time as the FONSI, but the FONSI will not take effect until after the seven days are definitely over. And if you have any comments, you've responded to them. And uh, should just point out that we don't publish funds. Okay, all rad is okay. 
Well, if it's part 58, but then the RE will be doing it. So Housing does not publish. So you'll be publishing a okay. final notice by itself. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, this probably won't come out as much with you guys, but it might. Um, if another agency has done an eight-step process, we can adopt it. And there's different criteria for uh, basically showing that there's no litigation occurring. It describes the same action that um, we're doing, and um, we're going to also abide by all mitigation required. Basically, comes up with supplementing uh, FEMA assistance, USDA assistance, or uh, Veterans Affairs assistance. So, so this uh, has come up. Well, another agency. So, so we've got <laughs> Josh and Kat and Martha. I think are working on a particular deal where um, Coleman did do uh, the, the eight-step eight step process. And when does that happen? Is it a when someone did a Part 58 by mistake and it should have been a Part 50? Um, or is it because FEMA or someone else was already building on that site and they already went through a process? When would this, when would this occur that some other agency has already done something? Uh, both those situations, I think it would occur. Um, usually it's when HUD comes in with supplemental assistance to either another uh, federal partner and we're just coming in after the fact. I mean, normally you'd want to be on the same review as a, a cooperating agency. But um, also, if you have a city that has gotten through the environmental review and then the county wants to add funds, this can also okay. come up as well. Okay. So you don't have to redo the same exercise twice. So another one of my added slides, so this actually did come up recently, is very oh, yeah. kind of saying, yeah. <laughs> and people were asking, well, how do we satisfy what's in 5526, which is uh, what Jeremiah just went through. So the guidance I gave were these kind of five things. So there's the requirement about being no pending litigation. I suggested that we get a certification from the agency saying that that was true, since we probably would have no idea. Um, we'd get the documentation of the eight-step review from the agency. We'd put together a statement for our 4128 that mirrors the adoption language. That's within uh, 2455.26. And uh, then just kind of make sure that all of that stuff is uh, referenced in the 4128, uh, the, you know, that adoption statement and whatnot is put into the 4128. And if there are any mitigation measures that were in the HF review of this other agency, we would, we would put that in the 4128. That's all this is outlined. Great. Okay. Um, this is another very important part. Uh, make sure that you um, acquire flood insurance or whoever is going to run the property acquires flood insurance. Um, and if you're using grants, this requirement is going to run with the property as long as there is an economic life to the building. Um, I know this only applies to buildings, um, generally four walls and a roof. Um, FEMA has some exceptions that I don't need to go into for two walls and a roof or three walls. Um, hopefully we will not be dealing with that type of project. But those are also covered as well. Um, and no, you do not have to insure roads or sidewalks. They are not insurable under the flood insurance program. So is that all, all projects built in the floodplain? In the 100 year, yes. Under floodplain that have federal assistance need to buy flood insurance? Yes. And that would be true even if, if I'm, uh, I'm not doing new work, just existing project that today... If you're acquiring a site, it, same. it says if you're acquiring or improving, basically. Okay. So it's another thing that you should definitely consider when you're considering project cost of an alternative site, uh, because that requirement is likely not going to get cheaper over time if you've looked at, even with Congress reintroducing grandfathering, you're, you're looking at a pretty dire future with your flood insurance premiums. And also considering the programs, a couple tens of billions underwater, pardon the pun. But um, then also the one bite rule, which mainly applies to federal disaster assistance, someone to be aware of. Um, if they receive disaster funding, then they don't retain flood insurance. They are ineligible for disaster assistance um, for the life of the pro property for that person. And again, we recommend flood insurance for any structure, not just those in the 
floodplain, but realize that that's not always realistic for all programs. Oh, and monitoring flood insurance, typically in the file there should be an up-to-date um, policy receipt or any type of documentation that they have a current policy. Um, you can actually put on or have them check a box on their application or flood insurance that you'll get notification of any changes to the policy, whether it lapses, they increase it or decrease it. Um, it basically is a box that says other under second there's a box that's second mortgagee or mortgager. Um, and basically it takes the work out of the way for the uh, staff here at HUD or the RE. So instead of having to keep requesting and keep monitoring and making sure things are up to date, they will notify you and send you a letter when something changes. Okay, and um, that was the uh, floodplain and flood insurance portion. Now we're moving on to wetlands. And you're going to see a lot of the same, actually a lot of them are the very same mitigation. And, um, Tell me the difference between purpose. a wetland and a floodplain. Okay, a floodplain is used to describe the probability of an event occurring. So you've got your 1% annual chance. And they are uh, made by man on a map. Um, a wetland is more of a biological entity. Uh, it has uh, three different parameters. So you're going to have a season, it's either, either seasonally wet, has hydric soils, which are kind of a sandy soil, or it has a hydrophy, or hydrophytic plants, which are a specific type of plants that are more prone to these type of areas. So it's more of a biological and um, organic where, issue. Where do you find out that something is uh, wet? Is it, are they also located on the map, or is it some, yeah. some engineer has to affirm that that's a, that that's a wetlands by independent um, uh, professional opinion? It's both, actually. But um, we'll get into that with the National Wetlands Inventory and some of its limitations as well. But again, the main thrust is to avoid, avoid, avoid. Um, the best way to preserve wetlands is to not be in one with development. Uh, if we can avoid this conversation, I'd love to do it as well. Um, <laughs> but I know that's not always possible. So we're going to get on to some of the um, other requirements involved with wetland, potential wetlands development. And again, you're going to have some of the same requirements. So if you can't avoid, you're going to have your ASAP analysis. You're going to have exceptions as well. But um, the exceptions for wetlands purposes are, they don't really apply directly per se, because when you're talking about wetlands, you're more worried about new construction. So if you're typically staying within a building's footprint for a rehab and you're not paving any new areas, you're not going to have much to worry about because you're not disturbing new ground and causing new construction oh. impacts. Okay. So again, your documentation is very similar. You're going to want to either have an exception, a statement saying that you're not causing any ground disturbance or no new construction. Um, <clears throat> Or you can use incidental purpose or incidental. Can you talk right now, sir? Incidental portion can also be used to be safe if you want to have a covenant to protect the wetland and maybe get some uh, tax credits or other um, funds out of those areas. Oh, and this is a quick disclaimer. Um, this is a different process than your 404 process. Um, the terms wetland are very Similar, but due to recent, well, not that recent, but case law over the past few decades at the Supreme Court, they have kind of reduced uh, what is considered a biological wetland through a legal definition of what's jurisdictional and what's not. Um, for our purposes, we are not as concerned about those jurisdictional requirements. We're more worried about the biological. So, and easy thing to remember is if you have a wetland that has a 404 permit, you are definitely triggering 11990. But if you have a wetland that does not trigger a jurisdictional permit, you're most likely and more likely than not also triggering 11990. Um, we just care about is there a wetland, not if it has 
a connection to navigable waters and all the different analysis. And yeah, so if you would see an application where they say they didn't need a 404 Clean Water Act permit for this, so there's no wetland, you should be suspicious because that doesn't necessarily mean anything. The, yeah. the reach of the executive order is broader than the reach, the reach of the 404 permit program. Yeah, they sometimes use jurisdictional as a weasel word to kind of yep. say there's no jurisdictional wetland, but there is a wetland there. So be on the lookout for that as well. Um, and these are two tools that we use. Um, since we're going broader than Army Corps, we, we can use the Fish and Wildlife Service Cowardin Manual and also uh, the 1989 Interagency Manual that was later ascended. Um, both of them have a more robust definition of wetlands delineation and um, are usually what we turn our consultants to where there is either a debate with the inventory or there's a wetland that it's thought to be uh, it's thought to exist but may not be mapped on the inventory we can skip that I think I covered it um, okay, now we're getting into the wetlands protection uh, eight-step process. Um, again, step one is to find out is there a wetland on the property. Um, the primary screening tool is the National Wetlands Inventory. We should also be aware of any state and local data you may have. Um, the National Wetlands Inventory is a, limit, a program of limited funding. Um, I'm friends with the director of it, and he will be the first to tell you that they do not have every wetland mapped, and it is not to be used as um, the sole end-all, be-all of all wetland existence in the country. It's supposed to just be, um, it's basically just the best we can map now with the resources we have. Um, and this is an example, this is about four years old, but it just shows you some of the areas are not, some whole areas are not even mapped in the system yet. I think they're a little bit better now, but um, even in the areas where they say they have data, uh, you can have some issues related to um, tree canopy and just other changing issues um, with the ground as it evolves due to storm events, hurricanes, or um, any other natural and uh, man-made changes to uh, topography. And uh, here's an example of a more extreme uh, National Wetlands Inventory map. Uh, basically, that little swath in the middle there of buildings, that's the only part that's not a wetland on this map. So all the part in the ocean, all of the river, those are definitely wetlands for our purposes. So if you're ever playing around in the water doing anything, you are in the wetland. And um, if, this, if the map says you have a shaded um, polygon, um, that's going to be considered a wetland for our purposes, um, unless you can basically get a statement from the Fish and Wildlife Service saying that it no longer exists. Oh, and um, also be aware that there is a pretty strong link between wetlands and floodplains, and a lot of times, especially in coastal areas, well, and riverine, um, you'll have both. So you can combine the two processes, and it, it makes more sense to combine them. Combine them than to not. Um, one, you're going to have less notices, and two, um, the wetland is actually a very important natural, what's called a natural and beneficial value of the floodplain that you should be considering throughout the process. So a lot of the same minimization techniques and same impacts you're going to be worried about for wetlands are the exact same ones you're worrying about for floodplains. Yeah, that, that takes what I just said. So. <laughs> okay, and again, you've probably seen this before a couple minutes ago. You're going to need to have your public notices. The only difference here is you're going to have your wetland acreage instead of floodplain acreage. And uh, again, you're going to consider alternatives, alternative sites, um, alternative footprints on the same site, um, and other means to uh, reach the purpose of the project, and also consider a no-action alternative. Okay, and again, if you proceed after the alternative analysis and after your uh, comment period to uh, the impacts, you're going to want to look at 
a lot of the same issues, but these are more uh, to do with your groundwater and um, flora and fauna again, your plants and animals, biodiversity. Um, the difference, another difference between wetlands and um, floodplains is uh, wetland area is generally a lot more sensitive and has a lot more unique uh, plants and um, wildlife. Um, a lot of times you can also see a cross uh, with a ESA, endangered species analysis. So these are just different things that you have heightened alert for for wetlands. Again, as we said earlier, you're going to evaluate your different impacts and your economic factors. Uh, a lot of times with wetlands, you're going to have to do a substantial amount of filling um, because Oftentimes, wetlands are lower-lying areas, and they have a sandy soil that's not the best to build your foundation on on its own. Um, so although the parcel itself may seem cheap on its own, you will want to consider whether actually developing there is in your interest when you consider these other costs. And again, after looking at your impacts, you want to look at how you can minimize them. Um, you can redevelop wetlands on another site, that's okay. If you can preserve them in a similar watershed through a covenant on an off-site, that's okay too. But um, generally you're going to want to, as we said earlier, avoid these wetland impacts whenever possible. And here again, so these may seem like repeats because they are. Um, again, you have your bioswells, your green roofs, perennial service areas covenants and easements and uh, compensatory mitigation, which is what I was talking about earlier. You can have a few different kinds. Uh, one is you contract with someone and they give an easement on their property saying they will preserve wetlands for perpetuity or some number of years due to your impacts and you pay them money to preserve wetlands on their site. Or you can uh, restore wetlands that were previously drained. Um, Basically, you try to bring that wetland back to life um, by addressing the water or plant issues that may have occurred. And um, the least attractive, but another um, alternative under compensatory mitigation would be to wholesale create a wetland. Um, I'm kind of skeptical about a lot of that because most studies say the success rate is somewhere between 30 and 40 percent, and it's very costly. So you're not really getting a lot of bang for your buck. On that's what we just kind of went through. Um, and uh, also, USDA has a conservation easement for the program, and they're usually willing to help you out as well. OK, so if you've looked through all of your alternatives, your impacts, your mitigation, and you still want to engage in this process, and I haven't dissuaded you from wanting to continue, you're going to reevaluate and um, look at the relative cost of the alternatives and the site and uh, make sure that there's no information there that actually says that, hey, this other location is cheaper after I have to fill in the wetland, after I have to get a 404 permit, after I have to secure the foundation in sandy soil and pay for the snail garter to move somewhere else and all of the other different trials and tribulations that occur when you do this. Um, after you do all that, then you have to explain it to the public in step seven. That's an X, yeah. So again, you're going to want to tell your story, uh, reasons why the construction must be located in a wetland, the alternatives you considered, the mitigation measures you're going to want, want to pursue. And this is exactly the same as the floodplain analysis for the most part. And again, you're going to want to make sure that implementation um, takes place. Um, I mean, a lot of times, we want to be clear with any contractors and anyone else that if there's a wetland on site, make sure they're not putting heavy equipment on it and everything else. Because even if you avoided having the building actually in the wetland, if they're bringing all of their heavy machinery and just you know RVing it right through the wetland, you're not going to have the same wetland impact that you had on paper and uh, definitely going to be destroying it in reality. And, uh, something else to be aware of. So again, to, in order to be both repetitive and consistent, uh, avoidance is the first priority. If you can have, at all avoid this process, 
and avoid the cost of publication and mitigation and everything else, you are uh, being a better steward for both the floodplain and the wetland. And that's the ultimate goal, is to avoid these areas together. And uh, so the picture on this slide, that's, is it a, a bad example or a good example? That's a failed bioswale. So they try to com uh, compensate for a wetland area by putting a bioswale in um, a wetland area you know, in there, but um, after spending tens of thousands of dollars, it didn't take hold, and now you just have some dead brush and uh, drainage issues. Gotcha. <laughs> this is a more extreme example out of, I think it's Island, but um, it deals a lot more with uh, coastal erosion, but um, yeah, you can get too close to the water and have <laughs> water views that um, come at a very high price. Kate's Oh yes, case study. I almost forgot Blue to put Street. this in here. All right. So Booth Street. Um, we talked about Booth Street in the context of uh, contamination issues, and there were a few times throughout there where we kind of said, "Oh, and look, it's by a water body too." So we might want to keep that in mind. Good. So for Booth Street, there were a few different documents that we could look to um, for the issue of whether or not there is floodplain uh, or wetland. So phase one ESA had some indication, even though it was a true phase one ESA, in that it only looked at site contamination. Some of the maps you could see there was something going on. There's also this uh, environmental report uh, that was put together by D3G. It's just one of the companies we usually deal with, one of the consultants, um, that had some information in maps. And uh, then they, as part of that, there was a wetlands map included. And there was some discussion of possible wetlands floodplain issue in the PNA, uh, which is always a handy thing to be looking at when you're doing environment review because it can tell you, for example, past flooding, um, whether there needs to be repairs done on that, and uh, that's a good clue. So from the phase one ESA, you might remember this map uh, that we looked at when we were talking about site contamination. It shows that the site, which I believe is marked by that weird green little circle crosshair thing yeah. uh, is near some more bodies. So it doesn't necessarily mean you're in a, a wetland or floodplain, but it can get you thinking. Uh, and then in the PNA, there was a discussion of some excessive ponding and evidence of flooding water tables. So to me, that kind of says possible wetlands issue, not necessarily floodplains, because it's more about, you know, what. Um, Jeremiah was talking about with maybe some biological yeah. indicators. Um, so that's also a good clue. But we get to our wetlands inventory map, and there does not appear to be any wetlands uh, on the site or near the site. Okay. And that's also, that map was included in the documentation, but also referenced in the environmental report. So the last piece of evidence uh, from the environmental report is the firm map, which reveals the site is not in the floodplain. So you'll notice. Um, we know it's on the that red box is the site, yeah. and you'll notice there's the same blue coloring that floodplain. was on the map that Jeremiah was talking about yeah. with us earlier. Yeah. That's the floodplain. And you might notice also in the very bottom um, left-hand corner of the map, right under the site, the big site arrow, there's a little tiny bit of blue. So there's a, a floodplain kind of close, but not quite there. So the question I had, if we just go back to this slide, is but is there evidence of flooding? Now I pointed out, you know, in the PNA they talked a little bit about pooling water and that kind of stuff. It probably doesn't warrant, um, you know, doing a whole analysis based on evidence of flooding. What we'd, what we'd really want to look for is like whether there are high water marks on buildings. Uh, we need a little bit more information, but it's worth noting that we can uh, require additional analysis for floodplains or wetland type issues based on that kind of information uh, if we want to. So in this case, I probably wouldn't recommend it because it's kind of like a, not, not quite enough to go there, uh, but there have been cases where we have done that. And that's through um, some language in the map guide um, and some stuff that, you know, just kind of I suppose executive orders too. So we have the ability to do that. And here's just a list of our resources, all the good websites that we have, and then also Jeremiah's phone number. After you call Hillary, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go.
So any questions? If you want to speak, uh, you use the raise your hand tool there. Um, and if you want to type something else, you can use that tool. Nothing? Well, we'll maybe try a question that somebody told me they were going to ask. Yes. <laughs> and maybe you're feeling a little shy about it right now. Uh, I had a question. Yeah, <laughs> within my thread. A uh, question came up yesterday during our RAD monthly call about how we know uh, basically when there, whether or not there are alternatives. Like when can we say there's a no alternative situation? Um, so we actually talked about that quite a bit. There's always today. a no no action alternative. Yeah. You always have the ability to just say we're not going to do anything. So at minimum, that is the other alternative. Yeah. So if you don't like that answer, person who wanted to ask a question, please raise your hand. <laughs> Although I did get into a philosophical debate with an interagency group about having a no action alternative, and I tried to explain them the alternative to not having a no action alternative means you could have a just parade of horrible possibilities and have to pick one. And uh, I don't think NEPA or any executive order demands that we are forced to pick. So Mike, you have your hand raised. Mike Furta? Yeah, hey Jeremiah. <laughs> hey Hillary. I, I got some uh, a concern on 55.26. Uh, there's some confusion um, in the office here. And that's the adoption of the entire review as long as the eight-step process was completed, correct? Or is that just the adoption of the eight-step process? It's just the um, or wetlands or floodplain process. Just for wetlands or floodplain? Yeah. Okay. That, that's what I was trying to explain. But, you know, we have an adoption of other agencies' reviews um, under the Stafford Act. So there seems to be a lot of different regulations floating around. Yeah, that's only disaster assistance that, that applies to. We tried to get a CADEX not subject to, but CEQ would not let us. So we, we can adopt uh, PHA floodplain or eight step process or another owner's, um, or we can try to change site. Um, uh, but we uh, can't adopt if they get a 58 and a full. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, basically. The component of the eight step we can adopt, but not the entire environmental report. Right. Okay. Yeah. There's, a, there's a provision in Part 55 that specifically, which is the part that covers floodplains yeah. and wetlands, specifically on adoption. For executive for those two executive orders only. Right. Yeah, in our Part 55. Yeah. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Any other questions? It's amazing on this topic. We have more questions. I think everyone's thinking a lot, which is totally fine. Does that scare everyone out of the floodplain? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, if if there's no other questions, then you know, of course, we're happy to take those later. Should you have them later on? Oh, wait. It's Are you saying that the no action alternative is all the alternatives need to be considered? If you look at 5520, it says that off-site alternatives should be considered. So under the reg, you should be looking at um, alternative sites, but it does not say must or shall. So best practice is to always look outside the floodplain, but at minimum, you should consider no action. That was one of uh, Chris Hartnow's and I's should and shall arguments that we had throughout the <laughs> last rulemaking. Those are always fun. All right. Any other questions? Last chance. Okay. Well, right. if you come up with anything, let us know. Yeah. Make sure to check out uh, the information that's available on the HUD Exchange Environmental Review website. I know you guys are just starting to look at some applications. Uh, and this might come up, and that's a great resource. And you know, once you've had a chance to look at that, uh, you got some more kind of specific questions about, all right, I've read I'm supposed to do this and this. Now, what does that mean? Or you know, what next? Give us a ring. We're here for you. Your field staff, environmental field staff, are there for you. Um, good luck. Thanks.
Hillary and Jeremiah, thank you very much. It's great. Thank you.